But now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Tom Bishop. So Dr. Bishop is a clinical psychologist and associate professor with the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Michigan. He serves as the director of interper interprofessional education with the medical school and as an assistant residency director within the Department of Family Medicine. He received his doctoral degree in clinical psychology at Wheaton College, where he has also studied theology. Dr. Bishop has spent almost 23 years of his career in interprofessional education and collaboration. He served as a core faculty in the Department of Interprofessional Education from the Ed Academic Health Services Center, Health Sciences Center at East Tennessee State University. He has worked with organizations in addressing culture, leadership, and in team development. He has worked with agencies in developing, developing interprofessional education curriculum and integrated practice. Please welcome Dr. Tom Bishop. More importantly, I've been married for 37 years and have three kids and four grandkids. <laughs> I got to tell you, it's really hard coming up after that. <laughs> but I'm reminded this morning, my wife, who couldn't be here, she's with her parents in Grand Rapids, shares with me every time I do one of these things, she sends me a text. And it says this morning, as it always does, is remember who you are. And so, while I'm here to kind of give the psychology overlay, I want you to know that it, I, I come with it with some intrepidation and some challenge because I tend to think of psychology as one way of knowing, but it certainly isn't the only way of knowing. I'm a Wheaton grad, which means that when I was in grad school, we were encouraged to study the nature of persons from a number of different overlays. And one of those is certainly whose we are, who we're made in. And that means that there's, there's something more than just the psychology. So I'm going to do my best to kind of outline the psychology piece, but I want you to know that, that I think that's one way of knowing and it has value, but it's, it's an overlay on the whole part in which we image God. And I'm thinking of when, when we just heard our last speaker, Romans, she, she quoted Romans 5, I think. Romans 8 is one of my favorite places to go. And I remember years ago trying to unpack Romans with a group of high schoolers. We started from the beginning and it took, I thought it was going to be a month. We were about eight months in. And, uh, and it was amazing watching their excitement as we actually unpacked Romans. And if you go to Romans 8, if you read it from the message from Peterson, and that's, that's not a place to study from. I'll just tell you that. It's a great paraphrase, but the poetry of it, I think, captures it. Because in the first part of that book, or that chapter, I'm sorry, he, he quotes there where God went after the jugular in sending his son. Right? And the part that I think resonates with where our last speaker was, where I'm trying to make this bridge, is when you get towards... Uh, verse 12, 14 there in Romans 8. So, and this is again is a paraphrase. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent. There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. Right? There are places to go. We don't owe this world culture one thing. And I think that's the place to start. Who, who received the ball? Can you throw it to me? Do your best. You don't have to be perfect. Nice. I'm glad you're sitting there. What I think is interesting about this ball is it was bounced and we were noting the recovery, right? What happens to the ball as it's bounced and it's an expression, if you will, of resilience. We're really kind of unpacking all kinds of things about this ball this morning. We just maybe in some ways kind of reflected on how the ball was made. I'm sure this wasn't made in the image, but you get the idea. And I'm supposed to, in some ways, tell you maybe what the ball is made of, in essence. Maybe from the psychological standpoint. 
I will try to return this ball to you in a moment. Um, but, uh, and, th and that's what I'm going to do in the next few minutes, is to sort of give this overlay of, of maybe the psychology of where resilience comes from. And if we were to go anywhere in that, I think the place to talk about is one of those individuals that's considered the father of positive psychology. So I'm older than I look. I've been practicing somewhere close to 25 years. And so I've watched the whole field of psychology shift in some ways. Early on, the focus had been largely on dealing with problems. And the father of positive psychology, Dr. Martin Seligman, if you've heard of him at the University of Pennsylvania, was challenged by his daughter one time. He shares this story about his daughter calling him out because he was kind of seen as a grumpy guy at one point. I guess that's maybe not so unusual, right? And he became disillusioned in some things. And his young daughter at the time said, you talk about all this. He was known for learned helplessness, by the way, and depression, and that's where Dr. Slegman did his research and yet he was finding himself in the same state of affairs and when his daughter called him out why are you so focused on that there's got to be something else he made a flip in his whole career and this is where now we hear a lot of things about notions of resilience things like what does it mean to be flourishing flow these kind of concepts are now happiness there's a lot of research that has come out of this sort of thing and it really is kind of built on from what we had heard earlier today that, that conflict in sandpaper moments, if you will, that I heard someone refer them to, help us grow. They help us actually achieve. It's not just about treating depression through helping folks find some sense of joy, but it's the learning how to be resilient, the in spite of, if you will, in the midst of things that where we can find real growth. And so he shifted his whole career to look at things like resilience and happiness and hope. Where does that come from? And so... Um, I'm going to try to kind of dance across these sorts of things this morning in, in unwrapping this notion. What are the psychological components? Again, I'm feeling like this is a little off from what we just heard in the last little bits, but bear with me on this, okay? What gives one resilience? What are the characteristics of those who are resilient? And what can parents and family and organizations do to do that? Okay. In other words, what is this ball kind of there? There's a lot of things here. I, I, I will tell you as I've taught, I never stick to slides. I want you to hear what I'm saying. So we're not even going to get lost in that. Um, but what we have found is that if you're going to really start to address things like depression and anxiety, and particularly anxiety, then, then really the, the, the deeper elements that we're going to unpack here actually are the antidote to depressions and anxieties and mental health and these sorts of things. So if you catch nothing else, is if we can build a whole state of what we call these deeper characteristic kinds of things, character even, if we can build those and address those and strengthen those, they are the antidote or the way to offset the onset of things like depression and anxiety. What was shared earlier about young folks today, I think, is so true. There was a person that said the number one thing that probably is involved in children's lives when we see problems is really about anxiety. And this was back in the late 90s. I think it's still true. And so we're going to do our best to kind of unpack these things. Mastinson here made a list of what was described as resilient factors. These are those deeper things that I'm referring to. If we were to address these individually and in families, we have a better shot at addressing the issues that often plague us. And so things like sensitive caregiving, close relationships, social support. It was interesting. Um, I did nothing but peds for a while uh, in my life. Uh, and when I was in Tennessee, um, uh, 
well, even back in Kansas, I got a chance to work with a couple of high schools that were struggling. There was some suicide, and in Tennessee there was a shooting that actually happened. It's one of these that has been known nationally, and I was part of the critical incidents team that got brought in to help the schools recover during that time and help the communities. And after Columbine, one of the biggest pieces of research that came out was, was the notion that we, we're not adequately connecting with those kids on the fringe. These are the kids that aren't going to be in, in football teams. They're not the kids in band. They're the ones on the fringe. And are we aware of those families and kids that are on the fringe? And how do we sort of do that? Well, that's about connectedness. There was a pediatrician in Tennessee in one of the most impoverished areas of Appalachia in the country who um, decided to buy out a warehouse and he started an after-school weightlifting program and it wasn't for the athletes. He wouldn't even allow them. It was for the kids that had nowhere else to be that were the awkward ones. Right? And you'll see that kind of woven in here, right? That sense of belonging, cohesion. I think that's one of the things that was mentioned about the, the social media kinds of things that, yeah, there's a social component to it, but it's not the level of connectedness, feeling really a part of something, being valued. That should sound real familiar to things like Romans 8. Should feel real familiar with things like Paul and others, right? The things that we kind of believe in. How do we bring that into things, right? As you can see, I kind of think theologically as a psychologist. They're not distinct. So bear with me, and I apologize if I'm not giving you the purest sense of this. But if we go down this list, self-regulation, family management, group organization. This family management is that, if you think about it, even in your own family, how do you approach conflict and challenge and when the chips are really down? There's some families that tend to kind of rise to that occasion. I don't mean like it's perfect, but they have a way they go about it, and then there are other families that get bowled over by it. They don't really have, they haven't developed a way Right? And so the families that tend to have some sort of strategy, some sort of anchor, some sort of belief in something, tend to do well in this. this. Again, this is this list of those deeper factors that allow one to cope and manage and deal with things differently. As was mentioned, how do we help prepare our children for the road? It's addressing these kinds of things. Individuals with these sorts of things tend to do better when they face conflict and difficulty. Leadership skills, agency. Do you tend to believe that things happen to you or do you believe that it's within you somehow to take on what's in front of you? Right? Um, sense of agency, problem solving skills, hope, optimism, confidence. Mastery, motivation, motivation to adapt. There was a psychologist at one time that believed that everybody should take on an adventure at least once a year. And what he meant by that was an adventure where you had to face some sort of challenge. And so, uh, you know, as in my family, I told you about my three kids, we were intentional about that. How do you create scenarios where they have to face and experience challenge? And if you want to know more about that, I can tell you about that. Um, purpose and a sense of meaning. This week, um, some of us were at this breakfast with Jim Harbaugh, and you remember that he said there was a family belief. We sat next to his parents, which was, we got to learn some of the secrets, I think. <laughs> and one of the sayings, the family motto, was something like, approach every day with the enthusiasm that is unknown to mankind. Now, he said it much louder and with a whole lot more... <laughs> but it's Saturday morning, okay? But I, I know even in my own family, we believe, you know, most of my family, we were runners. My wife and I met on the track team at Saginaw Valley, and there's a saying that's in this running world is that there's a point in the middle of a race where you decide, is it, are you giving it everything you can? And if you've done enough, there's no sense to have any regret. And, and that's a family motto. What's your family motto? What's your individual thing that you believe in the most? Those that tend to be rooted in something like that, that's resilience. 
That's what helps you prepare for the road that's in front of you, that it doesn't overcome you and lead you into things like burnout or depression or anxiety. Is that making sense? Is that connecting? Positive views of self, family, or group. Positive views of self, understanding who we are, where we're at, what's our reference, what are we called to. And then positive habits, routines, rituals. We tend to do better when there are routines and rituals. And so when you think about that from a family life, helping to build resilience in kids and things, rituals, resilience, these things, or I'm sorry, rituals and habits and routines tend to be key to that. Okay. So here's a list of some findings that are in the research. Resilience is a multi-systematic dynamic process, right? There's several different factors that help with that risk. In contrast, the study of risk factors, resilience is a less prominent topic. It's still not addressed to the level that you would find in psychology. We tend to still, even with Dr. Seligman's work, tend to focus on the negatives. But there's hope in that because even in the world, like if I was to ask you what's the number one way we tend to treat depression from a therapeutic standpoint, you would probably say things like cognitive behavioral therapy. Many of you have probably heard of that, right? Well, I'm old enough to watch that there are many different waves now. When I was in school, there was just what we were taught. Now I guess we're on the third or fourth wave of cognitive behavior. One of those is acceptance and commitment therapy. Have any of you heard of this? It, you have. And so what's interesting is it's actually the notion of, ex, of bringing in the, the, the concept of values. It's still this, where's your thinking? How does that relate to your emotions? Does that connect with where your behavior is? And if we can change any one of those doorways, we can help treat your depression or anxiety. But this new wave also says, but what do you value? What are you most rooted in? Which leaves door for those of us that are theistic or have a Christological perspective, right? Because there is a place for that. Um, Resilience is unanimous, un, unanimously negatively associated with depression. I've kind of talked that. There's certain at-risk populations. What we find is those that have essentially are in settings where you are facing so much negativity, it's hard to experience those positive things. Usually in those environments, it's where somebody was exposed to something that's outside of their experience that is so dramatic that they can start to hold on to it. And what I mean by that is, and this is where these concepts are kind of personally challenging, I wouldn't be here today if it hadn't been for a teacher or a coach or an uncle who said that there was something more than what was just in front of you. In certain populations, when we talk about how to rise above to face that road, you got to understand it's a little bit like describing a Picasso. And if you don't have individuals present enough to do that, that might be all you see. You catching me? So the value of any of us to be alongside those in those you know, disadvantaged kinds of communities or folks that are experiencing incredible poverty or other challenges, it really is about us being willing to take the risk of coming alongside. Um, so just some of that. This is just speaking to these deeper strategies. This is another list of those, but maybe framed a light, a slightly differently. How do we help folks develop a sense of courage? Understanding reality, the realism. Capacity for pleasure, putting troubles into perspective. Troubles in the context of things. Goes back to Romans 8, it's not all about us. How do we understand that what we're experiencing is a moment, but it's not everything? can be hard, even when it could be a lot of everything. Um, Future-mindedness, looking towards that it's not just in this moment, finding purpose, honesty, insight, interpersonal skills, perseverance. Um, there's a, a good set of research out there that framed it in this way. I like things that are nice and concise, and it talked about these, these seven C's. And so, um, 
to give the context again, if the psychology of resilience is that we need to be more aware of how to help folks overcome and in, in have that focus of uh, in spite of, to not just see things as deficiency, that you have a sense of agency. If we can build these deeper aspects of personhood, that will allow someone to overcome or face adversity then one way is put in this framework of these seven C's. And they go like this, and this competence. And this is the notion of uh, knowing how. I think with our kids, we can't just expect that they're just gonna learn this. So I would ask you to think about, from a family perspective, what are we doing as a family or parents to provide opportunity for our young folks to learn the competency? I remember one of the things that was really great about Wheaton is that the professors would often start with prayer or some um, devotion some, or some personal thing. And I remember when my one professor that came in that was teaching about cognitive behavioral things, um, he was a Vanderbilt graduate, he said this, he said, I want you to know that my mind is not here today because I'm thinking about my daughter who I didn't wake her up this morning, I'm leaving her to herself to figure out how she's going to get to school. <laughs> now she was like early junior high at the time. And he was lamenting about a parent saying, like, I'm leaving it to her to face whatever the consequences of it. Small change in a lot of ways. But I think that can have big notions for us. When do we allow our kids and how do we allow them to experience that? Because that's the building of competency, right? Um, confidence. Finding one's own ability. Now this is where, for me, there's a rub between the science of psychology and being theistic because psychology is often the notion that it's all internal. Well, that's inaccurate. So when I mention this C, I'm thinking of that as where do you find your confidence? And part of that is what my wife Barb said this morning, remembering whose you are. So confidence in self, yes, but confidence in the context of how we're made, right? So I'm just going to add that little piece here. Then con uh, connection, kind of talked about that. A sense of security, the notion that we are part of something. Self, um, this character, self-worth, sense of right and wrong, the character um, that's the essence of who we are. Do we have that notion of right and wrong and where we, what we need to be? Um, and then when we talk about this contribution, uh, this, this notion that we have a role to play within the community and society and the church that's around us. Young folks need to see that they have a part to play. So I've often asked when I was uh, doing family ministry at one time, do, you know, what's your family's mission statement? And I think if you ask my adult kids now, they would say one of the things that we tried to instill in them is the notion that you need to serve or volunteer or to give. There's an old Mennonite saying, we lived in Kansas, and it was like the notion if your father asked you to clean the garage, you found one way to do just a little bit above what you were asked to do. And I think that's the essence of this C. And then this notion of coping, having the basic coping skills. How do you go about that? Instilling those in our kids, teaching those. And then the last one here, control. Control over decisions, that it's within you to make the determination of where you're going to go and how you're going to do that. All right? Um, I, I'm restating these. I told you it was never about the slides. It's about, yeah, I think I'm going to end with this. Um, we really believe in my family this notion of, of adventure. This is my son. He's finishing. I thought this was a great ending slide finish. This is him finishing a 100-mile trail race in Idaho. That first picture that was up there was me waiting for him at one of the spots for hours 
as he was struggling through a time where his stomach just wasn't working well and it took him hours. He thought he was going to drop out and he didn't. If I can say nothing else, it's, it's the notion of that what we might think of as adversity, and there truly is suffering and struggle in it, but to realize, at least from the psychology part of it is, going back to that ball, is that we were made in the image of God in some ways. We were made to have a mind and thoughtfulness and reflection and personality. It's how do we temper those things and bring those things in order to prepare us for the road that was set in front of us. And there are many different ways. There's value to focusing on the way we think about what's there, the way we feel about those things, and what decisions we make in doing those. That's that combination. But to not see it as just in terms of problem-oriented, but how do we use and prepare for that? And as families, if you catch nothing else, it's the notion of learning to be intentional in the way that we're doing it. So asking oneself, what are we doing to prepare our kids? What sorts of intentionalities do we have in that? What rituals, what things are we doing to build on that? How are we planning and preparing for what we want for them in front of us? More often than not in our culture today, we find our families running from one thing to the next. I bet there's some of us in this room that would say you don't even have much room or time outside the car and driving somewhere. And so maybe it's time in our culture, going back to where I started, to reshuffle that and think about how do we really build the fortitude and the psychology end of who our kids and families are. Okay? Thank you.